All right, everybody, and we're back for the third video. Um, we may be able to finish up in this one. It may go into four videos. We'll see how it goes. Let me throw my timer on here just to make sure i um, staying on task. Uh, so I'm going to go back to our screen share, and we are going to discuss star wheel adjusters. So uh, back to our adjuster. I keep talking about this adjustment um, that happens with drum brakes. Each one is a little bit different um, in when they adjust or how they adjust. For the most part, all your star wheel adjusters are going to be pretty similar, though. Um, a lot of the designs will adjust when you're in reverse and you stop. Um, that's actually a good majority of them. Uh, others adjust in other ways. For the most part, they adjust out automatically. Um, however, as long as they're in the correct conditions. However, most of the time, um, they will need to be readjusted back in when you put on some new shoes um, or new drum or anything like that. Uh, star wheel adjusters are also gonna be part or should be part of your drum brake service um, because they do have to spin in order for them to adjust. If you don't lube them up regularly, they won't adjust and your brake pedal will just have to travel further and further um, and you'll get, end up with a low brake pedal. Um, so that can happen as well if the adjustment mechanism is not working properly. A lot of times um, in duo servo designs, they may be called floating adjusters since it's um, actually in a leading trailing as well. Since your adjuster isn't really mounted solidly to anything, um, it's sort of just an in between your shoes. A lot of times they'll call them floating adjusters, but most of the time they'll call them a star wheel adjuster because of that little gear that's on them. Um, I always do this to me. Sometimes they can be located up right underneath the wheel cylinder, so sort of up to the top. Sometimes they're at the bottom. It's not a leading trailing duo servo thing. It's just sort of depending on manufacturer or how they set that up. Um, some adjusters are going to be, uh, are, are gonna utilize a cable adjuster in order to help actuate that self adjuster. Um, so you can see here, uh, when you're taking the drum apart, here's the little O-ring piece. Um, it's not an O-ring, sorry. It's uh, like an eyelet piece that's going to sit near one of the springs. And it's generally going to have a little cable guide that uh, allows the cable to go around it. And then we'll connect down here on the bottom where the override spring is. Um, different designs will call for uh, different component usage. Uh, anytime you are working on a set of new drum brakes, it's always a good idea to check out your service information um, or at least take lots and lots of pictures uh, so you know how to reassemble the drum brake. In fact, most of the time that is going to be half the battle on when you're taking anything apart nowadays. Uh, back in the day when I started as a technician, our cell phones are really crappy. And taking pictures wasn't always an option. Not everybody had camera phones, believe it or not. Um, and I'm aging myself now. Um, no, so now we have camera phones that take better pictures than your DSLR cameras that are professional grade. So um, utilize them, take pictures of everything before you take it apart. The worst that's gonna happen is you won't need it, you can delete the picture, um, but at best, you would be like, oh crap, I forgot how that went back together. Take, take pictures, lots and lots of pictures always. Um, really taking anything apart, but especially drum brakes. Uh, I'm gonna share a quick little uh, silly story for you. So back uh, in 2006-ish, I believe when I took my brakes class, um, uh, before we got into drum brake designs, it was at the very beginning of the semester, I was helping my, at the time, boyfriend, now fiance, um, take apart drum brakes on his EF four-door Civic. And he was doing one side and I did the other side. And we didn't take any pictures because, again, no real good camera phones at the time. And um, we had no reference. So no pictures provided or anything like that in service information at the moment or at the time we didn't have it. And so we <laughs> kind of looked at each other and was like, oh crap, we don't know how this goes back together. 
Um, and that was a real big issue. So um, I ended up asking uh, Mr. O'Connell, for those of you who know him, um, you know, if I should just do a disc brake conversion. And uh, he, obviously he laughed at me because I was in a brakes class. Uh, but that's actually exactly what we ended up doing because we didn't have any reference. We didn't know anybody else with that vehicle at the time. Um, there wasn't pro demand. Uh, and all data at school, we just had what was Mitchell on demand and there was no pictures. So unfortunately, we were kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. And I was a newbie at the time since that was one of the first automotive classes I took. Um, so we we're just like, ah, screw it. We were going to do this anyway. So let's convert our disc brakes. <laughs> um, and that's what we did. It looked better anyways. I would never do that now. Obviously, I've taken apart plenty of drum brakes enough to know. Uh, a little bit better and now that I know all the componentry it's easy to figure out where things go a little bit better but always 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 take pictures <clears throat> and I believe that's gonna be it for star wheel adjusters um, I want to briefly get into uh, drum brake service I don't have tools to show you right off the bat so there's just gonna be sort of piece by piece I'm gonna explain some things um, so much like some of your disc brakes had screws that held them in place, they weren't actually responsible for holding the whole brake assembly in place, uh, but while everything was off, it held, you had the two screws that held the disc brake in place. Well, sometimes instead of screws, you may have something called Tinnerman nuts. They don't really have any threads. Um, they are actually just for assembly when uh, the manufacturer builds everything. So if you're taking a drum off for the very first time, you may come across these Tinnerman nuts. You can just use some pliers to take off. Um, they're not very hard to take off and they are not necessary to go back on. If you want to, it's not gonna hurt anything, but there's, if you lost one or you damaged one taking them off, it's not really necessary. They just are holding the drum in place during assembly uh, before they put the Tyler wheel assembly on. So uh, those Tinnerman nuts are just for assembly purposes. Um, when you are reinstalling brake springs, there's special tools that you're going to use. Hopefully I have a picture here. I'm going to try to uh, put a video on um, at least one or two designs um, from YouTube in your resource area so you can know exactly how uh, to properly use the drum brake tools. That I'm going to show you guys. I'm really bummed that I can't be the one to show you, but it, however you get the information, it's important that you get it. So um, this tool here that the technician is using is actually meant for retainer springs on the shoes. You can see I've got one spring here and one spring here. How that is set up, I'm actually going to take us out of screen share here for a moment and I'm going to show you uh, how those return springs are put in place. So I've got a backing plate, right? I'm not gonna draw everything else on there. Uh, and then I'm going to have, I'll draw the shoe in red. So we'll say our shoe material looks like that. And if we were to be able to see past the shoe into the webbing that's holding the shoe in place, I would have a little round plate that from the side, I'm just gonna show it as a flat plate uh, that actually has a little slot in it. Um, but if I was looking straight at this mounting plate, it'd be round and it would have a rectangular looking slot in it. And what you're also going to have holding this slot, or, or I'm sorry, this plate is actually going to be holding down a spring that's holding it to the backing plate itself. And then down through the center to hold this spring in place. Because remember, we need a little bit of movement. Um, it, it shouldn't be mounted hard to the backing plate. Um, that's what the spring is for, it's to allow a little bit. And then I'm going to have, uh, obviously, a hole cut through, sorry, a hole cut through um, my backing plate as well for this all to go through. And I'm gonna have a little pin that has a head on it that's going to go all the way through and has a little flat plate on the back. So that pin is shaped kind of like this is, sort of rectangular. So you can fit the pin through the hole. So how you're gonna do it uh, is, uh, I'm gonna sort of go backwards from say you're installing it. This pin is gonna go through and it has a little 
backing plate to keep it from going all the way through the backing, backing plate on backing plates. Um, <laughs> some hot backing plate on backing plate action. And you're going to stick the pin through the slot in the backing plate. <coughs> Excuse me. And the head of the pin is going to slide through here like so. And when that head slides through this front plate, you're going to turn it sideways so our slot sits something like that. So the pin is actually holding this front plate in and compressing that spring. This is gonna make so much more sense in a video that I give you or in person when you actually do it. Um, I will try to get the best video possible for the moment, um, but just bear with me. Hopefully my drawings are giving you a little bit of clarity. I am not the best drawer. I will not be teaching any art classes in the future.